be police officers? I, did you think I, about it? I very much did, yes. You can take the police exam um, until you're 35 in New York, and every year I would talk about it, and every year my husband would beg me not to. <laughs> I think he just thought, oh my God, she'll really do I would say, no, no, I just want to do it for the, for the, you know, the research, and he'd right. say, oh no, I know it's going to happen. No. I mean, he didn't forbid me, but he, he really was not comfortable. He felt it would be dangerous. Mm. Um, and, and the truth is, you know, I, I really think it would be hard to be a full-time police officer and be writing fiction. Yeah, um, I, yeah I think you'd have to choose. <laughs> yeah. So, um, it's not often that, uh, that I get that, that thing that, that, uh, that buzz in my chest in, in interviewing someone. Um, and it's not because I interview, it's because I interview a lot of people all the time. But this was definitely a chest buzzy kind of, of uh, note when they asked me to do this. I, I felt very honored. Uh, Jennifer Egan, in her own words, is a sneaky writer. As we read her work crammed with impeccably researched scenarios and expertly framed immersions into areas as if possessed by her own personal TARDIS, we can't help but feel a bit smarter, a bit more knowledgeable with every passing paragraph. But unlike your dry as bones intro to, I don't know, chemistry textbook, her subjects are explored with such a colorful and engaging grasp of prose that you barely notice the intellectual and academic depth and breadth of the writing. Uh, academics describe her writing like this. She venerates the grandparental moderns even as she places their myth mythography under erasure and dismantles their supreme fictions. <laughs> I'm glad you guys had the same reaction that I had. <laughs> if anyone wants to explain that to me later, you can, because I have no idea. She is an idiosyncratic writer. In 2012, she wrote a short story called Black Box. It was posted one tweet at a time. She wrote each tweet by hand first. She possesses a kind of sneaky we readers yearn for. In 2011, the Pulitzer Committee, in awarding Egan's A Visit from the Goon Squad that year's prize for fiction, mentioned her big-hearted curiosity. Her latest, Manhattan Beach, was recently long listed for the National Book Award with more nominations coming her way, likely as we speak. Manhattan Beach, like all four of Jennifer's previous novels, it's immersive, almost exhaustive in its research. And uh, it's a bit of a departure for a, and a surprise for any unsuspecting Jennifer Egan fan. We're gonna talk about the story itself, but first I just wanna welcome to Toronto, please Toronto, a warm welcome for Jennifer Egan. Well, welcome to Toronto. Thank you so much. You just got in? I did, although I've been here before, but okay. it's great to be back. Well, we're, we're, it's wonderful to have you back. Uh, I, should, I should kind of set up the story of, has anyone read, well, it's just come out, so most haven't read it. So this is a story, it's set in the 1930s and 40s, it's Brooklyn, uh, the Great Depression and Second World War providing this backdrop. The story of lives of an Irish family in Brooklyn, our heroine, a young woman named Anna, who against all odds, she becomes a diver to help the war effort. All the while, young Anna is haunted by the disappearance of her much-loved father. The father caught up with the mob. He has his own story of loss and regret. Um, he is the, kind of the fulcrum of the book, his murky disappearance. And then there is Sexy Dexter Styles. <laughs> We're gonna talk about him a little <laughs> later. He's an associate of Anna's father, a successful mobster, who I quote, gets swept up in the cultural tides that threaten everything he's built. So that, in a nutshell, is Manhattan Beach. And I haven't given anything away, there was no spoilers. No. So let's start with, uh, before Manhattan Beach, the Pulitzer. How is life post Pulitzer? <laughs> um, well, I mean, pretty good. Uh, yeah, I would, I would imagine. <laughs> it's, it was very strange and, and kind of paradigm shifting for me to win something like that. I've, I've just always thought there were people that happened to, and I was not one of those people. Mm. I guess maybe everyone thinks that. Right. Um, 
but it was very, I mean, I'm, I, I don't think I'd ever won a raffle, um, <laughs> you know? You went big when you decided to win <laughs> something. I would always you know, look, at, look at my ticket when they would read the number. So it really, it was just, I mean, it continues to amaze me even now that it happened. I mean, most of all, it, I feel very lucky because it is luck that makes you win those prizes, as anyone knows who has helped to judge them, and I have. You know, they have a very iconic quality, but the truth is it just means the right bunch of people happen to like your book that year. Right. And it, that luck could have gone to someone else, and so it feels, I mean, that just adds to the sense of slight, not arbitrariness, but, but just tremendous luck. So I feel very lucky. Something surreal about uh, having all of those elements come into place. Yes, and nail it, it really right is. I but mean, you did, did write a pretty good book. Well, well thank that's, you. Thank that's you. the other part of it, the other element there. Well, I, I'm proud of my book, but the truth is a lot of people do write good books, and there were a lot of good books that right. year, and one of those could easily have won. And I will think about that sometimes because I think, you know, then they would have had all the opportunities that I've had. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm the kind of person who, when I watch, you know, a, a, a baseball game, I, I'm watching the team that didn't win and thinking, oh my God, they must be feeling so bad. <laughs> so my son is like, stop that. The team we like won. Um, but you know, I can't help but also think about the other point of view. So I try not to get too lost in that, but I try to just let it reinforce my sense of, of tremendous good fortune with that. Right. So um, A Visit from the Goon Squad is the name of the, of the book. and. I, I wonder, you, you, you pick up the Pulitzer, um, and then, and, and the book that you've written, so inventive and audacious and turns the literary world on its ear, and then you have to think about the next thing. Yes, well, in fact, I had already been thinking about the next thing when I wrote A Visit from the Goon Squad. In some ways, that book, which is very much about time, was influenced by some of the research that I did for Manhattan Beach, which involved a lot of speaking to people in their 80s uh, in the first decade of the 21st century, so it's lucky I was doing it then, right. um, who were looking back on the very early formative years of their lives. And I think it did get me thinking a lot about time passing. Um, so in a way, Goon Squad was sort of, a, in a way, a bit of an epiphenomenon, if you will, of mm. Manhattan Beach. Mm. When I sat down to write Manhattan Beach, it, first of all, too much time had passed. I had spent a lot of time promoting Goon Squad because, again, I had just been at this long enough to know that luck was never gonna come again and I didn't wanna waste it. Right. Um, then I was writing Black Box, the right. story you mentioned, which actually took a long time. And so it was 2012 before I sat down to write this new book, two years after Goon Squad had come out. And so, um, so that was already not a great feeling to feel like, okay, it has to be good and it has to happen fast. Right. <laughs> not ideal. Right, no, no not great conditions. <laughs> um, but anyway, so I, I, had, I had the thought that I would use some of the techniques of Goon Squad in Manhattan Beach, specifically the leaping into the future and having that reflect on the present and the present in this book being the 30s and 40s. I found that that was really sort of dead on arrival as, a, as, a, as an idea for the book. It just did, it was almost bizarre how something that seemed to work so well in mm -hmm. one book was, mm -hmm. was so unsuccessful in the next. It just didn't, it was, it not only was um, unappealing, it was actually worse than that. It sort of made people angry. <laughs> so right. Not what you want when you're writing a book. Yeah. So I, I had to let all of that go. And then, it was only then that I discovered I was writing a more straightforward book. And as I struggled with it, and I think I was uniquely ill-equipped to write this book, because time and place are only really the only point of connection for me between my life and that. my work. Okay. And in this case, I didn't have even that, because it was outside my lifetime. So when I began to feel that things were not going well, and I wasn't writing a, a book that seemed especially inventive, and I had won this huge prize, which I knew was a lot of luck. I did have a couple of rough years there of thinking, okay, maybe I'm just done. Do you feel the, do you feel these people, not these specific people, but kind of like people like them <laughs> in the room with you, kind of over your shoulder as you embark on this journey for the next thing? Because this is what happens. All the eyes turn to you once you've won something like that, and they're turning to you for the next. 
I didn't feel, I mean, it's not good for me to feel a lot of people in the room with me. That's already a sign. See, for I most think people, it's when not I, great. When I feel people in the room, they're they are fake people. They're people that are actually standing in for my own harsh side, which speaks through their voices. They're really not you guys, who I'm sure would be a lot nicer mm -hmm. than the things I say to myself. Mm. So it, that, that's a very, um, there's something really dis distorted about when I start invoking an audience because all the audience is saying is the things that I fear they might say, not things they probably would say. Yeah. Um, so I definitely felt, I mean, there were, there were points where I would just say, everything about this book is worse than my other books. And I would sort of go down the list. Right. It's very unproductive thinking. Um, I was, you know, I often think like if I had, if you had a boss who talked to you that way, <laughs> you would quit. <laughs> um, you would say, this is abusive behavior. I won't stand for it, <laughs> but I can't really do that. <laughs> so um, yes, there were some year, a couple of years where I felt really bad. But luckily, I'm extremely dogged, and I can work even in pretty bad conditions. So I just kept going. And why historical fiction, then? You said you went down the, the sort of experimental path that, that you did with, with Goon Squad, and then Well, this. you know, there was no, I, I, there was nothing, I didn't think I will write historical fiction. It's, I always start with a time and a place. Mm -hmm. With Goon Squad, it was a woman in a bathroom who sees another woman's wallet and decides to take it. That is basically what led to that entire book. And then I followed all kinds of characters and situations that led from that moment into all different times and places. With this book, I just was inclined toward New York during World War II. I didn't exactly know why. I still don't exactly know why, but I think it had a lot to do with 9-11 when New York felt like a war zone right. overnight. Um, and also when I, and I think probably everyone in the world, thought about the trajectory of global American power and what this event would mean in it, to what degree this event had resulted from it. And in my mind, I thought, how, how did it begin? What did it feel like when that post-war American power came to be? What did it feel like during the war? Mm. So all of that led me to be really interested, I think, in New York during the war. And I just wanted to know what it felt like to be there. It was really that simple. You went deep in, in getting to that feeling. I had to go pretty deep before I felt like I could really feel it. Right. Um, I, I learned something really important, which is it's not enough to just know what people wore and even said and, and what, they, what kind of cigarettes they smoked and those kinds of things at a particular moment, that's almost, that's the least of it. Because we, we're all in this moment now and what we bring to it is the prism of our own pasts mm -hmm. and our shared cultural past. Mm -hmm. And that stuff is what really matters. It, to write about people, I had to know that. And, and that took a lot longer than finding out about cars and cigarettes. And For sure, because I, I've read about in, in writing historical uh, fiction that uh, there was a quote that I wrote, and, I, and I'm sorry that I can't remember who wrote it, but they were talking about it in terms of uh, there's the literal stuff, the things that you have to get right, but the real trick of making it work is getting to the emotion that that literal stuff has to dig up in the story. And it's the, that emotional um, element that makes it uh, work or not. Very much so. And for me, something I think about a lot when I'm writing are people's habits of mind. Yeah. You know, we all think in our own ways. We organize reality in our own ways. And I need to know how my characters organize their reality. And again, that all comes down to what they come from. Mm -hmm. And especially because I, I, not only don't I write about people I know, I seem to be unable to do it. I wish I could. So I, these people, I have to, I, I, I guess I'm inventing them. It doesn't quite feel like that. It feels more like I'm discovering them. But what I found before I reached this point of, of synthesis or kind of deep knowledge or engagement with the period was that I felt very stiff. I felt like I couldn't really do my thing. Mm. And I just, the result of that, it was a good analogy is trying to have a, com a complicated conversation if you don't really know a language very well. Right. Like I remember thinking when I was a student in Italy, you know, in Italian, I'm actually dumb. <laughs> <laughs> 
I mean, how do you define intelligence? I, I can't, I don't seem to have, I can't express complex ideas. Right. Therefore, it's as if I didn't have them. Right. I don't understand things very well. I can't get nuances. Like, who would want to talk to me? Right. <laughs> And I feel like that's kind of, I was sort of writing the equivalent of that way right. for a while. And I thought, who would want to read this? And well, yeah, it's no wonder you, you got to the point where you were, I think you read, I read that you were nauseous around yeah. it, that you were nauseated by what you had written. I felt, I did feel kind of a physical sickness at times about it. I, I was so happy not to work on it. I was always looking for reasons not to work, which is <laughs> not, you know, and I, then I would think, I just need to get the book done. But the one problem was all I wanted to do was not work on the book. Um, yeah, there, there, was a lot of, uh, there was a lot of chasing my own tail. Mm. But at the same time, what was always going on was that I was always continuing to research. Right. So even when I didn't write, I mean, I, I did a lot of research before I even started writing, and that was kind of experiential. Mm. Um, I, I, I talked to a lot of people, luckily, because they were already quite mm -hmm. elderly, some of them. I had some adventures. I went to a reunion of army divers and, and got to wear the Mark V diving costume and other things like that. And then once I sat down to write, since I don't have a story before I start, mm. at that point I began to get a sense of the story and then that led to lots of research in the moment. So the research was always fun. And I think that is, was a crucial element of all this. Because first of all, I was doing something that I enjoyed, which was great. Second of all, a lot of it was so arcane that the fact <laughs> that it felt important seemed like a good sign. I mean, mm -hmm. if I could be on the elliptical machine at Crunch Gym reading a detailed pamphlet called How to Abandon Ship, <laughs> <laughs> Which meant, and they didn't mean that metaphorically. No, it this was, was real, about real what to do. Yeah. 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 Then, I, then I thought, well, this has to be leading somewhere because this mm -hmm. is not something I'm going to be using in my daily life. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so that was very heartening. And then I also even enjoyed it so much at times and felt that the experiences I had were so valuable and the people I got to talk to were so marvelous that I would think, you know, even if it goes nowhere, Okay, so I spent a few years, you know, contributing to an oral history project, right. being on the advisory board of a, of a new museum at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. You know, there are worse ways I could have spent my time. And all of these things happened. I, I mean, this was the first time, and I wanted to bring this up to you, exactly this, because there are a couple of names that popped up in, in getting ready to speak to you that now I've kind of gone down a rabbit hole of trying to find out a little bit more about them, including Andrea Motley Crabtree. Oh, she's who wonderful. Who is was the first uh, diver, female diver in the U.S. Army. And I, and, and I saw her name and I thought, I need to know a little bit more about her. And I started to look at pictures of her. Not only that, she's an African-American woman. So even at, on top of that, I, I just felt like this is fascinating. And you got to sit down and talk to her in researching for Anna's life. Yes, and in fact, I've never met her. We want, I want to meet her, and mm -hmm. I think we have to find Can a I way come? to. Can I That would be fun. Okay. She's, she's so great. I've probably spent a total of 10 hours on the phone with this woman. I yeah. mean, she's really great. And what was so wonderful about her was that, well, it's, I mean, her, she is a joyful, um, articulate, wonderful person, but her story is a sad story. I mean, she was essentially driven out of diving by sexism. Right. And what's interesting is, as you say, she's African American. I don't know if the issue of race came up once hmm. in discussing why her diving career didn't work out. Hmm. It was all about being female, which mm -hmm. was very interesting. The men really, really didn't want her there. And ultimately, she had to go. <laughs> I mean, it, she was in a position where she couldn't get promoted anymore, so she moved into another part of the army and ultimately became, you know, like a commercial diver and did different things. She doesn't, she's not bitter, but it, sexism drove her out. And it's interesting, she talked about how, when she read the book, and she's been really supportive and mm. sweet, but she said, you made it too easy on her, <laughs> which was amazing because it's not like it's easy it for Anna. It was not easy for Anna. <laughs> but it I think that the, the, the reason that she said that is Anna is able to succeed right. in some measure and, and, um, 
and Andrea was not. Well, that would have been a very short book if Anna didn't yeah, exactly. succeed. It would have been like, <laughs> okay, and then she did there. it, and then, yeah, yeah if, if that was the, the case. But I do want to talk about Anna, and, and I, also I want to ask you about Lucille Culkin. Oh, um, yeah, she's who, another. Who is another. Uh, kind of a guardian angel. So tell me about Lucille, and because a lot of this story, I mean, you talk about the oral history project that you worked on around the naval yards, and Lucille was, you really dug into her life as well, and she shared quite a bit. I did. Well, I, Lucille, I, I keep wanting to say I met her, but I can't say that because I was reading her letters. Um, that was long before I spoke to Andrea or any of that. I had just gotten interested in the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and I wanted to try to learn what it was like to work there. So at the Brooklyn Historical Society, there was this cache of letters written from Lucille Culkin to her husband, Al. They met at the Navy Yard. He was a machinist, and she was a shipfitter. They married precipitously in her letter. She called it from maidenhood to marriage in three easy months. Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> he joined the Navy, and then he wrote letters to, her, letters to her as well, but there aren't as many of those. And she wrote passionate garrulous, informative, I mean, you couldn't ask for better letters, and she adored him so much. Um, and, and, you know, they're handwritten, so I really felt like I was sort of in her mind. Yeah. And there was a, a very kind of profound moment that occurred, which was that she was writing about, she'd had a dream that they'd had a son, and she, and she sort of fantasized for a minute and said, oh, Butch, that's what she called mm -hmm. him. Um, you know, what, what will we, what'll happen after the war? You know, how many kids will we have? Where will we live? And I thought, I'd love to know the answers to those questions. I wonder if I can, I wonder if there's a way to find her or talk to her. So I Googled, I walked straight over to the computer within a minute of reading this letter and I Googled her name and I was reading her obituary. And it was, it was really chilling to go from this youthful, mm. handwritten speculation about her future to a newspaper obituary that briefly said, you know, dove at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, had two daughters, survived by her husband, Al, done. And so I, I, I sat there and I, I felt sort of frozen. And then I finally went back to the letters, but for a while it wasn't the same to know yeah. how the story would end right. and to feel that I knew and she didn't. It was really eerie. Um, anyway, I, I wrote an essay about that whole experience because then she went, then she joined Al, and then the letters stopped, and I thought, oh no, why is she writing next? more? Yes, well, she had no reason to write. They were together, um, so I, I thought I wish I could do something more about this, but I, I had no ideas. So I wrote an essay about how much it felt like a friendship. Yeah. In a way, it felt like my conversations with Andrea because I never met her, mm. and, I, and her voice is in my head, too. So anyway, I published this essay in a, in a book of essays about Brooklyn, and about six or seven weeks later, I got an email on my public email address, and the subject line was, I am Lucy's daughter. Amazing. So she, her, she had two daughters, as I knew from the obituary. Her Al was still alive, and this oh. was in 2008, and we all went to the Navy Yard together. And it was amazing, and I felt a little shy around Al, because I knew a oh, lot so about him. Much. <laughs> so much. <laughs> and I just I wasn't sure kind of how to play that. Of course, of course. <laughs> and she would say things in the letters like, oh, I'm going to add a teensy-weensy teensy pinch on the aft end. Um, <laughs> the aft end. So anyway, Al was very reserved. Maybe he felt it, too. Um, but, you know, to be there with him, and he went back into the machine shop where he had not been since the war, which was now empty of machines. It just had a big wind blowing through it. And he looked around very quietly with his walker. Mm. So these were the kinds of experiences that made me feel like I, I was ahead no matter what the result. Absolutely. Um, so how did Anna come to you? Anna is your, your heroine, your, your main character, um, a strong feminist, uh, just an, an absolutely, the kind of woman that I looked at and thought, oh, I would like to be Anna's friend. You know, I'd like to know Anna. Uh, a kind of steely determination to do this thing. How did she, this is a part of asking you about your process as well, how did she come to you? Did she, did she come in bits and pieces or did she? That's a good, well, 
I will say that the, the characters in my fiction are the hardest thing for me to explain. And it does feel a bit mysterious. It feels like it's coming from outside me. I tend to have a more psychological view of things, mm -hmm. so I feel like I'm accessing my unconscious or some part of my imagination that I can't call to mind when I just sit down and think. The way I get to my characters is that I just start writing, and I write a first draft by hand. So in Goon Squad, that was, um, I wrote that in smaller pieces, mm -hmm. but the process is exactly the same. I, I knew that I was gonna be writing about, a, 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 I had a sense of a, a female who would be working at the Brooklyn Navy Yard. I knew that I had a sort of underworld figure who would play some kind of role, but I didn't know what. And I didn't really know that, that Anna's father would be important at all. I kind oh, of thought he right. would just be absent. But then when I sat down to write after those seven years of kind of meandering around while writing other books and doing this kind of fun research, I found myself writing about all of them meeting on a beach in the, during the Depression. And that was, I was not expecting that. I had never heard of Manhattan Beach, the New York one. I just knew from my reading at the Brooklyn Historical Society that Coney Island had once had lots of fancy houses, that it was like an exclusive resort right. area before the subway came. And then of course the fancy people were like, oh, look at all <laughs> these normal people, we gotta get out of here. So I was conjuring you know, a beautiful house somewhere in that area, mm. I wasn't quite sure where. Um, and and you know, this triad, this triad of important characters kind of appeared and in some ways, had their personalities right from the start. I mean, it took a while to get to know them. I think one of the things that was important for me to discover about Anna, and I don't think this is really giving too much away, is that when she, when we do meet her again a few chapters in and she is working at the Navy Yard, she's working in a, in a world where girls are considered to be either good or bad. That's right. And, I, and she's only 19, which of course in our world seems very young, almost like a kid. But at that time really was not. I mean, girls routinely got married at that age. Um, you, you, you were considered an adult at 19. Um, but I, Anna is really not innocent. You know, she has a kind of secret past mm -hmm. that was important for me to discover. And that made her more interesting to write about. She was so interesting, um, but there was something, it took, me, it took me a little bit to get into Manhattan Beach. It took a little while, and the, and the thing that, that sort of tipped it for me was this relationship that Anna had with her father. And, um, and it's interesting to me that you said that, that that relationship wasn't really, he wasn't gonna be such a big part of things because it was that relationship that kind of hit me in the gut is this, very, um, I think it reminded me of my own dad driving around in a big Chevy Impala with my dad and it was he and I and just our moments together. No one else was around and he would take me on these little, you know, trips around to pick up things and he would go into a house and come out and I didn't, he'd leave me in the car, I didn't know what he was doing, but it felt like that, that tight, that relationship between a daughter and a father, and I, and I wondered about that relationship and how it came to you, how it built for you, and what you tapped into to, to bring that relationship to life. That was so beautifully written. Thank you, well I think it, that is really the heart of the book, for sure. I mean, I, I think um, I too have very happy memories of times like that with my father. Um, my father and mother divorced when I was two. Actually, they never divorced, their marriage was annulled because my father was a very devout Catholic um, mm. and he couldn't get a divorce, uh, and, but he could get an annulment with a two-year-old, <laughs> so go figure. <laughs> Welcome to the Catholic Church. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but I, I think that a lot had to do with the fact that his father was a police commander who knew a lot of the higher ups in the mm -hmm. Catholic Church in mm -hmm. Chicago. Um, but anyway, so we, uh, after this, this um, annulment happened, I, spent, I would spend every Sunday with my dad and sometimes the whole weekend. Um, and those were really great times. We were on our own a lot and we just, I have a lot of memories of you know, being in the car with him or just going to church with him. And then my mother and stepfather moved me to San Francisco. So I really, then my father remarried. And in a way, I think in all the years after that, I would say I knew him less every year as opposed to the opposite. Right. So he became, we became almost like strangers to each other. 
I think he, he had three more kids, two of whom were girls. Um, and I think for him, I just was, I was like, I think I felt like someone he just he could he wasn't sure what my life was like. He was very we, he was very distrustful of San Francisco where we had moved mm. in 1969. So the counterculture was there and I think he felt like somehow that exposure was not good for me even though I my mother and stepfather were certainly not hippies had nothing to right. do with it. But I think it all just felt like it slipped out of his control. You know, I had my first communion but I was never confirmed. I didn't really go to church. So all these things were, were really hard. And then we began to, I think, maybe get to know each other a little bit. Oh, he also had a, a very serious drinking problem, which, which compounded all of this. But he got sober, and we were getting to know each other better after I was an adult. But then he was killed in an accident when my, in my mm. early 30s. So there's, uh, it, it feels like a very kind of unfinished relationship in every possible way, except for this lovely time I had mm. when we were when I was young with him so that clearly you know I was drawing on some <laughs> personal yeah. stuff there yeah, I would say <laughs> yeah um so I, of course I have this idea that I never write about my own life see how I never do <laughs> um but I didn't really know it and mm -hmm. and in fact the biography is quite different mm. um Eddie, Anna's father, does not have a drinking problem. Um, and there's, she has a younger sister who's severely disabled. And that is really the, the part of the family life that is so problematic. Um, and, uh, but I think, I think it, I, I, what I, and oh, I guess the other thing I would say is, I have two kids um, mm -hmm. who are 14 and 16, two sons. And I think, in a way, part of what the book is about is the difficulty of letting go of your children. Oh, well, sure. The difficulty yeah. of letting them be their own people. And I was writing that before I actually had to confront it in my own life. Mm. But I am amazed at how hard I find that. Yeah. I don't want to let them grow up. I didn't get that that would have to happen. I didn't understand it either. I have a 16-year-old daughter, and I do not, every day, I'm, I try to cling. Yes. And it's just not possible. No, it's actually, it, it's not possible. And no one likes to be clung to, especially no. a 16 year old. No, no, no. It um, always goes badly. I know. <laughs> <laughs> I know. So, so I feel like that was also a story I was telling a little bit before I yeah. really had occasion to know it firsthand. But as I struggled with this, I thought, huh, it's so interesting how there are a lot of parallels here between my situation and Eddie's. And, and that's the kind of scrambling that I do like to do. Mm -hmm. I, I, there's no way I could write a story about a mother trying to separate from her children. It's way too close to me. But somehow a father, you know, at that time, in such different circumstances, felt far away enough, I think, that yeah. I could manage it. And it's, and like I said, a, a beautiful connection uh, between uh, Anna and, and Eddie. Um, and a beautiful connection to the, the place, to Manhattan Beach and to New York and to the time. And um, all of this comes to this, this idea of, of you, the, the research and you pulling it to a point of being the emotion that we talked about. All of that literal stuff that turns into something else. I wonder about you as the journalist going into that that place of research and getting deep into it, because I know that journalism was a th is something that you that you are that you do, but also there was something else that's kind of research oriented that you thought about doing as a career that would have brought you down this path. Do you know what I'm talking about? Um, do you do you has something to do has something to do with your family? I'll give you hints. Oh yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Wait, you mean police work? Yes. Uh, yeah. Um, yes, I really, um, I, you know, my grandfather was a police commander and there's a lot of law, law enforcement in a sort of stereotypical kind of Irish American way um, on that side of the family. And I, I'm very, I'm fascinated by crime and, and by law enforcement. And I've done things like ride alongs with the police. Um, you know, I, I, I even went to, I went to a police academy and watched mock um, apartment entries, you know, where they had the, the, the students. She's immersive. Like, I mean, you <laughs> yeah. know, if she's going to do it, no you're just going to do it. You just did it for fun. <laughs> this is for fun. Just for good time. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, no, I, I, and my sister was with the U.S. Attorney's Office and, and was a, prosecuted a lot of gangs in Chicago. So I love her stories. 
my, my <laughs> uncle was a defense attorney for a while. So yeah, I, I, I love that stuff. Um, did I, you want to be a police officer? Did I, you think I, about it? I very much did, yes. You can take the police exam um, until you're 35 in New York. And every year I would talk about it. And every year my husband would beg me not to. <laughs> I think he just thought, oh my God, she'll really do I would say, no, no, I just want to do it for the, for the, you know, the research. And he'd right. say, oh no, I know it's going to happen. No. I mean, he didn't forbid me, but he... He really was not comfortable. He felt it would be dangerous. Mm. Um, and, and the truth is, you know, I, I really think it would be hard to be a full-time police officer and be writing fiction. Um, I, yeah, I think you'd have to choose. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, although I do like to try to do everything, <laughs> often in the end it seems that it's not possible, annoyingly. Um, luckily, kind of being a fiction writer and a journalist is sort of the closest thing maybe you feel this too, mm. to doing everything. Oh, because for sure. you can kind of learn about a lot of things, but then you don't actually have to work full time doing them. That's right, that's right. I, I remember a, um, a, a great journalist, uh, Andy Berry was his name, he was one of my first mentors, and he said, you know what, Garvia, when you have this job, just go out, do, if you wanna jump out of a plane, you can just go to someone and phone them and say, I'm a journalist, I wanna jump out of a plane. Tell me about it, how do I do it? And then you just jump out of the plane. And, and I, I didn't jump out of a plane, but I did sort of take him up on that, you know, doing some, some things, yes, being immersive. Absolutely. And I, I mean, it's amazing how willing people are to tell their stories to they, someone who's for interested. Sure. Yeah. Um, so I feel like it, it's, it's a delicious job. And I will say, I don't know if I could have acquired the technical knowledge or had the confidence really to acquire knowledge in so many areas that I really had to be fairly conversant in to write this. The Brooklyn Navy Yard, which is a place with its own storied history dating back to the Revolutionary War, deep sea diving in the 1930s and 40s, right. and then also the Merchant Marine, which is, you know, I mean, nautical matters are, uh, I mean, there are people who know a lot about that stuff. Mm -hmm. It has its own language and history. It, a fascinating wartime history, actually, in America. The Merchant Marine lost more uh, men, I think it was only men, per capita, uh, proportionately than any of the other armed services. They mm. were, they died in droves. Yeah. Because the U-boats would blow up merchant ships. It was easy to do because they were poorly armed. Um, and, and until sonar was better developed and convoy shipping became more common, it was actually really easy. And they would prevent really valuable stuff from getting where it needed to go, like mm -hmm. tanks and, and, you know, planes and weaponry. So, um, it was actually a really interesting world to get into, and once again, you know, immersing myself um, involved going to a uh, Liberty ship, one of two functional Liberty ships that still exists in the U.S. Liberty ships were mass-produced cargo ships. Mm. Um, I, I think I feel like maybe Canada built them too. I'm not sure, um, but they were welded rather than riveted, which meant that they could be they were identical. I mean, they really were mass produced. And in fact, the record was an entire ship, one of them was built in four and a half days, wow. which is kind of incredible when you look at these things. I think it was 2,710 in total that, that we built. So basically, as fast as, as the Germans could blow these ships up, we, were building. we just kept sending oh. more out. Wow. Um, and on this Liberty ship in San Francisco are mariners who sailed during World War II. And they're incredible. It's amazing to talk to them. My favorite was a gentleman, is a gentleman named Norm Schoenstein, who was an engineering officer. And he was climbing up and down these catwalks. It's a long way down into the engine room of mm. Liberty Ship. And we spent hours talking. And he gave me all kinds of demonstrations and told funny stories. He was 93 then. Wow. Um, working at, on the ship several days a week. <laughs> I just, I, we're, we're in touch a lot now by email, but he complained after his 95th birthday a few months ago that they won't let him drive at night anymore. <laughs> it's so, it's, you know, it's a bummer. Right. Um, but he was, he's definitely driving during the day because he emailed me and said, oh, I heard you on NPR while I was driving over to uh, the Mare Island shipyard where the Jeremiah O'Brien is now in dry dock getting its, you know, checkup that it has every few years. So again, I mean, it, it Priceless, yeah. priceless experiences talking to these people. We were, we were talking a little bit about the, the crime element and, and being immersive in that because the book does have a pretty strong uh, 
there's a, the criminality that took place during that time. Mm. It felt very uh, film noirish in its in its construction. You can feel you could feel the you know the jazz in the in the clubs and the and the darkness in the mobsters and the girls that are all dressed up and trying to uh, woo the mobsters. All of that was so beautifully written. Um, but mob life. I mean, how do you immerse yourself in that in 2017? Well, I had to use more imagination for okay. that. But I will say that I was led to organized crime via so many different routes. I mean, there was no way to tell the story without it, really. First of all, the waterfront itself, which is really my milieu, finally, mm. was totally corrupt. And the movie On the Waterfront kind of immortalized that. On the Waterfront is derived from uh, a series of newspaper exposés that essentially just blew into the public consciousness the, the degree of corruption on the Irish waterfront, which was like the west side piers of Manhattan and also um, Hoboken. In, I mean, the unions were, were very dirty. They were exploiting the workers. No, the piers were falling into disarray. This is one reason the Port of New York stopped being relevant, actually. Mm. The piers were so leached of money and repairs that by the time it all came to light, it was sort of too late. Um, so that was one thing. And then organized crime was a factor of, of nightlife in all kinds of ways because criminals got organized really to take over the liquor business Absolutely. during prohibition. Mm -hmm. So not only did was there a, a feast of money to be made from this industry, but it really behooved the gangsters and the, the, different, um, the different webs of criminals to work together nationally in order to make this business you know, work better. Mm -hmm. it, was a, it was a corporate necessity. And the result of that was that culturally the gangster became a sort of appealing romantic figure in a way that, that it had not been before and I, I don't think really is now. Right. And gangsters associated with mainstream, you know, prominent people all the time. Right. And it started in, in speakeasies easies, and then it sort of moved into nightclubs even when the government took, back, took over the liquor business again in 1933. The, the, the gangster remained kind of a, a fixture mm -hmm. in popular culture and, and lived in fancy apartment buildings with right. bankers and movie stars. So th it was an interesting moment to get involved in, in that world and it, it naturally linked up with all kinds of other worlds. Mm -hmm. So that was a lot of fun. It sounded like a lot of fun. It, it, was, it, it was wonderful to uh, read uh, the fun that I think you had writing Dexter. Styles, yes, who is uh, is a mobster, but he's also a family man, and uh, I think that um, <laughs> there was a uh, a wonderful way of writing uh, the sensuality of Dexter. You know, he was just. A, did you fall in love with him a little bit? Were you well? A you little know, bit. Yeah, I, I, think think yeah. I think that's fair. I think that's fair. I mean. He was, you know, I felt a lot of sympathy for him because right. he has an existential problem which was suggested to me by so much of the reading I did. And in particular, a guy named Frank Costello who was a gang boss in New York and, and the quintessential sort of mainstream mobster. You know, he was, he consorted with politicians and, and you know, fancy people and he was well known. He was sort of famous. But, and he had this idea that, that he could somehow go legit, but there was no way to really be taken seriously as anything other than a gangster. Um, he, wasn't, he wasn't shunned for it, but mm. that was his category, and there was no way for him to really get out of it. And there, there were a lot of stories like this about, about gangsters sort of mistaking this cultural relevance for a kind of um, passport into something else, but it, it didn't really work. And mm. I found that very interesting and kind of poignant especially in conjunction with what World War II meant for women, which yeah. were all kinds of opportunities that hadn't existed before, a kind of mobility, if mm -hmm, you will. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, yeah, so Dexter just sort of came out of nowhere. As I, as I said, I had a sense that there would be someone like that, a sort of organized crime figure, but I was surprised at how easy I found him to write. I, 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 and it, it's typical for me, I think, because I... Don't, I don't like to write about myself, so I'm most comfortable when I'm in 
looking through a pair of eyes that is as far as possible from my own. Right. Um, and so, I, 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 and yet I really did relate to his kind of existential dilemma. Um, and also certain things about him, like I mentioned habits of mind earlier. Mm -hmm. One thing about Dexter is he, he doesn't like to reflect. He's a guy who translates everything into action. Right. He just, he, at one point he actually says, even the wrong action was preferable to no, to action, no action at all. Yeah. And that was sort of an appealing mindset. That is, if I could find a diametric opposite to myself, that would probably that would be, be it. it. <laughs> so there was something really freeing about being able to move around in his skin. Mm. And, and so I, I guess I, maybe I was in love with him, but I think what I mostly loved was being him. Right, <laughs> right, yes. I missed being him he when was, the book he, was over. What a, what a, 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 a character. And, uh, and I can't tell you how much I, I adore this little bit that you wrote about Dexter. He was a towering stranger with coils of dark hair that seemed to pour from his chest down his torso and pool around an assemblage of private parts that brought to mind a pair of boots dangling by their laces from a lamppost. <laughs> I can't believe you just read that. <laughs> that has stuck with me for so, because every time, <laughs> I feel like maybe I should apologize Every for that. Every time <laughs> I see dangling shoes, <laughs> now all I see is Dexter. Oh no. And that's, that's a problem. Well, needless, <laughs> of course I'm not in Dexter, that's not from Dexter's <laughs> point of view. No, no. I don't know if he would have said that about himself. Um, but we won't say whose point of view it is. No, we won't. <laughs> we'll keep that a secret. But uh, it's just a, a beautifully, beautifully written book. That was just a... That's a, What's next, then? Well, um, I, as I said, I was so unhappy to be starting late with this book, and so I thought, I'm going to try to write a second first draft at the same time, at least for a while. Because when I'm writing original Wait a material, second. A second first, another book, okay. I have a first draft for another book at the same time. Wow! Because I can usually only write five to seven pages a day of original material, and that often doesn't take that long. So it was kind of exhausting to try to do this, but I did come up with about 200 pages of something else. I haven't, I have, they're handwritten still, so what they are, I don't know. But I will say that <laughs> my goal is to write a kind of companion volume to Goon Squad, okay. which always has felt to me very porous and open-ended. It has a sort of iconic quality now because it's between covers, but I know that I failed on my epic poetry chapter. <laughs> um, the chapter that was supposed to be written like a play didn't work. Um, there were characters I was never able to pursue in ways that I wanted to. So Black Box is actually about a, a very peripheral character from Goon Squad wh whom I followed into the sort of 2030s into a more overtly kind of sci-fi story than exists in Goon Squad. It's a little more radical. Mm. Um, because you know she has technology inside her body, but she's essentially a spy. It's a spy story. Um, I like the thought of, and I have tried to follow other peripheral characters into their futures. Some of which take place in our future. Some of which are more contemporary and even in the past. So I don't know whether I can make that work. If it, it, making it work will require that it be, you know good and not just interesting because it's reminiscent of Goon Squad and it also needs to not be about time or music. Oh man. So the question is can I use some of the same organizing principles to be led into an entirely different land? That's the question. Well we await we'll the answer. We do. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>